I'm glad to, uh, to see all the friendly faces in the audience. Many of you, this is your third visit, and so welcome back. And for those for whom this is the first visit, we're glad you're here. I'd, I'd like to begin uh, first by thanking Bill and the, the uh, Foundation for Children with Atypical HUS for their ongoing support and help in making the work that our lab does possible. It's been a, a great partnership. And then I'd like to acknowledge the people in my lab who actually do the work and who interact with you by email uh, and, and give you a little bit of insight on how, on how we, we uh, function before talking about the genetics in the complement cascade as relevant to atypical HUS. There are 11 people, scientists in my lab, working on complement-mediated renal diseases. To the best of my knowledge, that's the biggest group in North America. And that includes many of the people here in the audience. Tara, who's getting her PhD on atypical HUS. Johnny, who's also working on a complement-mediated me renal disease. Stephen, who took a year off medical school to work on complement-mediated renal disease and is working on atypical HUS and uh, C3GN and DDD. Boo, who's a graduate student who we're trying to lure into the lab so he'll stay in the lab and do his PhD on complement-mediated renal disease. Amy at the back, who's contacted many of you and who you are probably email pals at least. And then Carla and Mike, who together with other people form the clinical diagnostic group in the lab who actually do the testing that's reported to you and your physicians. So what happens when you have blood drawn and it's sent to our lab? I thought I'd walk you through the process so that you know why Sometimes it takes forever to get your results and what's happening to your blood and all the steps that, that uh, are involved. So when your blood sample comes into the lab, it's given a unique identifier by Amy. It's logged into, the, uh, into our system. We have a huge database. Uh, the DNA is extracted from the blood. Some of you send serum and some of you send plasma. There's testing done by a lot of people, and you can see the names there. And then uh, interpreting the testing is not straightforward. It's not like, well, we found something, this is what it means, we send you a result. We have weekly renal group meetings. We have probably 10, 15 emails from physicians per week around the United States and North America asking, what does this mean? What do I do for my patient? How do I interpret this data? What is the next step? And so we actually discuss this as a group so that we're all on the same page, so we know what as a group we're doing and what we need to report to the physicians and to you so that you're getting the best care and the best information possible. So in order to do that, our lab is CLIA approved and Joint Commission accredited. So that means that every couple of years, somebody from the federal government comes by and they walk through our lab and they look at our paperwork and they look at our competency testing. So everybody who is doing the testing, Carla, Kathy, Mike, Young, Nick, and Yuzo, have to do competency tests every six months so that when they do a test, they know or you know that the result that they're getting is as accurate as we can possibly provide. Now, occasionally we still make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, but we have multiple checks and balances to minimize the mistakes, that, to minimize the possibility of mistakes. Because these tests are offered in a CLIA certified lab, because they're clinically available, any physician anywhere in the United States, in the world for that matter, can order the tests. They can send us a blood sample and request the test, and they don't have to ask you as parents or patients permission to get the test because it's like it's like when you go to your doctor and if you have strep throat and they do a strep culture and they send it off you don't sign a consent form to get a strep throat culture however after our renal group meeting 
sometimes, and it's a lot, we actually don't know what's going on. The result is unusual, it's unexpected, we can't explain it. And those are our pearls. Those are not the things we think, oh, wow, we can't figure this out. We're not going to study these anymore. It's just like way too hard. Those are the ones we want to collect. Those are the ones we want to focus on. Those are the ones we want to sink money into. And those are the, the uh, samples, the patients, the families that we devote a significant amount of time to trying to figure things out. Because if we can figure things out in these families, they have huge, it has huge implications for the entire medical community, the atypical HUS community, and the world community of the complement-mediated renal diseases. And a perfect example is Bill's family. And so then, what happens then, for us to be able to do that, we actually have to recontact you, not the physician, but we have to recontact you as the parent or the patient, and we have to get your permission to do that. Without your permission, and most of you have signed consent forms, some of you haven't, but without a consent form, we don't go forward because you haven't given us permission to do that. And Tara will talk to you about some of the studies that she's doing to provide new insights into the genetics of the disease and why we think now, more than ever, that's an important initiative. It also leads to better test development. So there's a significant energy devoted in the lab to actually developing new tests that are important to atypical HUS, and in particular to focus on biomarkers. And every, that's kind of a buzzword for everybody. And what is a biomarker? It's something in the blood or in the urine that we can monitor that gives us insight into what the disease is doing. That seems pretty straightforward. Why don't we do it? Well, the reason we don't do it is because we don't know what the biomarker is that we ought to be monitoring and looking at. So that's the catch-22. It's a great idea if we find the biomarker. And so part of the focus in the lab, the energy that the lab is devoting, is actually to identifying what biomarkers we should follow. Now, we don't have, there's not a, there's not a, a uh, a dearth of biomarkers. There's tons and tons and tons of biomarkers. We can follow lots of things. The question is, which one or ones are the best biomarkers to follow, and how do we figure that out? And the way we figure that out is what Carla alluded to. We get phenotypic information. We get clinical course information from you as parents and patients about the disease progression in a longitudinal fashion over time in people with atypical HUS, and we look at biomarkers, how they fluctuate over time, not in an isolated way, but in the context of the clinical course over time, in the context of what the creatinine is doing over time, in the context of what the LDH is doing over time. So as a global, in a, in a global context, and that requires a lot of data, it requires a lot of work, and it requires a lot of statistical analysis, all of which we're geared up to do, but which takes, again, time for us to generate the answers, which I have no doubt we will generate, but it also takes a commitment not only from us, but from you to provide us continued samples like serum and plasma, and they have to come a certain way, and so sometimes we get them and they're, we can't use them because they weren't shipped right, and then you think, golly, it's just a waste, and we've got to do it all over again. And, we think the same thing at our end. But it's really important to get those samples so that we can advance collectively our knowledge of, of uh, atypical HUS. And by doing that, by focusing on that, there are new genes that are discovered that are important in atypical HUS and new functional studies that are being made. And uh, Tara will give you some examples of the new genes that she's discovered and the way we're doing that and the impact that we think that that will have over the course of the next couple of years in uh, atypical HUS. And that provides us better insights, better tests that we will develop to help clinicians, better tests that will help patients and their families, and better parameters to follow 
so that we have a more sensitive and acute understanding of what the disease is doing and how it's affecting a given person who happens to have atypical HUS. So my objectives in the next 15 minutes are just to go over the complement cascade briefly with you and discuss some of the genetic causes of atypical HUS so that you have kind of a 40,000 foot view perspective of it, kind of an overview um, and, and a little bit better understanding. And what I'd like to draw your attention to on this slide is that there's lots of genes that cause atypical HUS. And notice that at the very bottom, in some patients, in some persons, there are multiple genetic causes. So there are multiple hits. And so what that tells our lab as a human genetics lab is that this is a complex disease. And if it's a complex disease, then we'll devote more resources to studying it. And we like the challenge of studying it. And we have the ability to study it. I draw your attention also to the deletions that can be associated with the disease, the uh, deletion of a couple of genes called complement factor H related 3 and complement factor H related 1. That's not a bad thing. There's several people in this room who, who carry only one copy of those two genes each instead of the normal two copies. And 3% of the population in the United States Every 30th person you, you walked by yesterday when you left the restaurant has no copies of those two genes. So that's just kind of a normal variation. Some of us have brown hair, some of us have no hair, some of us have blonde hair. It's just kind of the way it is. But what we do know is in patients with atypical HUS, the number of people with no copies of those two genes is actually more than we would expect by chance. It's about 15%. And so that's, that's something that's uh, interesting to us in terms of trying to figure it out. And it's associated with autoantibodies to factor H many times, and I'll show you a picture of that later on. Lastly, I draw your attention to this. In 45%, and this is data from 144 patients with atypical HUS studied in the United States, the largest series in the United States, one of the largest series in the world, in 44% of those patients, we didn't find anything. So does that mean that there isn't anything? Well, when you look at the other side, there weren't, that wasn't very many genes that we looked at. Each of us has 20,000 genes, and we looked at six or seven. Well, is it surprising that in 45% of people we didn't find anything? It means that we need to do a better job at our end to explain the genetics so that we can then do a better job for clinicians and for patients and their families to understand the genetic makeup of the disease because that gives us a better handle on what's happening. So Carla showed you uh, this picture of the microangiopathy and the schistocytes, the red blood cells that are look, look like helmet, helmet cells. You have low platelets. You have renal failure, as you all know. Carla showed you a picture of a thrombus. A th thrombi clot the blood vessels. If they clot the blood vessels, the area that that blood vessel is supposed to feed can die, and that's called necrosis. So you can get damage and death to part of the kidney. And you can get similarly involvement in other organs, causing also a multitude of systemic problems. So this is the complement cascade. And the complement cascade, like Carla said, is something that nobody wants to learn because it's complicated, it's overwhelming, and you know, so like like uh, Boo just joined the lab and I said, You wanna look at you wanna study complement? And I kind of show him the picture and I'm kinda thinking, how can I make it like look appealing because it's just like so overwhelming and I'm thinking he's going to say no and he's going to pull out his hair and run away screaming. But part of that is, you know, it's kind of like, like where's Waldo? When it's so complicated, it gets really interesting and you can get, you can really entice people into devoting a lot of time and effort to something that's really complicated because as you start to get insights into it, the complicated nature of it actually makes it more fun. So the 
the uh, complement cascade has three phases. And there's an initiation phase that can be one of three pathways. And I've shown in red the alternative pathway because that's what's relevant to us today. And I've also shown at the bottom that there's indiscriminate and spontaneous activation. So what does that mean? That means in each one of you right now, as you're listening to me, your complement cascade is active. You are activating C3 right now. Is that good or is that bad? Well, it's obviously got to be good or it wouldn't be happening, but if it happens in an uncontrolled manner, then it's bad. And that's what leads to a number of complement-mediated diseases. Now, I've shown you C3 as a model, and C3 is incredibly complex, and it's incredibly dynamic. It's like, uh, it's, it's like when you, when you uh, it's like a, a hose. I mean, like when you try and pick up a hose, it always changes shape. And C3, as it goes from C3 to C3B, to C3C, as it changes and gets another letter after the number, it's changing shape. And because it's changing shape, that means studying it and figuring out what it does is really, really complicated. So I'll just call it C3C, C3 there. So what happens after initiation is we have amplification. And amplification means in all of us that C3 is activated to C3B and it attaches to a factor B on that so you get this molecule, molecule called C3BBB and that's your C3 convertase and you've all heard of it and you didn't understand what it was probably but that's forming in all of us all the time but it's being tightly controlled and it's amplified over the course, when your complement system is activated, over the course of a quarter of an hour, you get 10 billion molecules of C3B that are generated. And that's a huge number. I was actually did a Google search for what is 10 billion, so that I could show you like grains of sand. Or, and, and I couldn't find a good one, but it's a, it's a huge, huge number. It's exquisitely amplified, and it needs to be controlled really tightly. And the end result is the effector phase of complement where you either get inflammation, lysis, or opsonization. Opsonization means whatever has the complement stuck on it gets eaten up. So that's all really good. It's really good if it's controlled. And it's really bad if it's not controlled. So exquisite control is necessary. So this is what's happening on the cell surface in the complement system. And I've shown it to you with the letters, but also with the models, so you can see how, how complicated it is. And we have the C3 convertase forming here. And then we have the, uh, it forms more C3 convertase. And ultimately, it leads to a C5 convertase, where C5 is cleaved to C5B, and we have another cascade. This is called the terminal complement cascade, and this generates what Carla showed you as MAC. So you have a MAC attack, membrane attack complex, and the cell is damaged. So how is that relevant to atypical HUS? So I'm going to talk about factor H in a little bit of detail because this is one of the most, most important breaks on the complement system. And I've shown here a pearl necklace with each bead, each pearl numbered. And factor H is like a pearl necklace with pearls from number one to 20. So it's a pearl necklace of 20 pearls. The pearls are not called pearls. They are called SCRs for short consensus repeats or CCM for complement control modules. So that's just the jargon that uh, researchers use. There's 20 and each of them have unique jobs and each of them have a unique function. So that means the first pearl is not like the 20th pearl. The 20th pearl does something different than the first pearl does. 
And so recognizing that difference was actually important to providing insight into atypical HUS and other complement-mediated renal diseases and understanding how factor H can form its shape and whip around has been under, it's been important to understanding how the disease, how, how, it, how it functions. It has a number of important activities. It helps break down the C3 convertase. It helps inactivate C3B and it competes with factor B for binding to C3B. And that's called fluid phase regulation. It does the same thing in your kidney on the blood vessel surfaces act controlling the activation process of the complement system. So here's factor H and the 20 pearls and this is a, a number of mutations in persons with atypical HUS and where they lie on factor H. And what you can see is they're pretty much in pearls 16 through 20 with most of them in pearls 19 and 20. And again, that's because that region of factor H has a different function as compared to the other regions. The other thing that you'll see on all of these slides when I look at the pro talk about the proteins is that I'm saying what the mutations do. They either affect the function of the protein or the level of the protein. So as researchers, we like to do functional studies and we like to follow the level of these proteins in the blood because that gives us insight into what mutations are doing when we discover mutations. And so these are some of the variants that are found in factor I, factor B, MCP, and then what we do. So I've given you an overview of the different mutations we found in different genes. And what we do is when we have our renal group meeting, we talk about a variant that we found, so we don't necessarily call them mutations because we don't know if they're mutations all the time, but we, they are variations, so we call them variants. We try to ascribe to them what we think they're doing to the protein, whether they're affecting its function or affecting its level. We try and correlate that with some of the lab studies that we've already done on you or we get on patients with atypical HUS. And then we try to figure out how to classify that mutation and then we enter it into a database. And so we build a database so that every year we become more proficient at determining what's happening at the genetic level. So there are complex contributions to atypical HUS. And that's associated with the factor H family of genes and I show another family. So that's me and my wife and our four kids. So we have six people in our family and in the factor H family there are also six. One, two, three, four, five, six. All of these members of the factor H family help control the complement system. Now, just like there's lots of family resemblance in human families, in genetic families, there can be lots of areas of similarity. And because of those areas of similarity, during recombination, when genes are kind of mixed up and, and, uh, and passed down from one generation to the next, you can get things that get missed, get deleted. And so this is the deletion of CFHR3 and CFHR1 that I mentioned earlier, that's a common deletion in the general population. And again, 3% of the population have no copies of CFHR3 and CFHR1. So, so that's, that's not in and of itself bad, it's just a variant. But you can also get variants where you get little bits of one gene cut off, like a, the end of factor H cut off, and instead of ending with factor H, it now ends with factor H related one. And that's called a hybrid gene. And that, that arises because of a complex genetic event in uh, human genetics that we call non-homologous allelic recombination. But what that means for short is, is that the, uh, you get a no novel fusion protein and that novel fusion protein can have new functions Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, sometimes they, it's got new properties so it's not controlled quite the same way. 
And those are important to figure out to provide a better understanding of atypical HUS. Now, in persons in whom factor H related three and related one are totally missing, they can develop autoantibodies, shown here, to factor H. And if those autoantibodies happen to bind to this end of factor H, those people will get atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. If they happen to bind to this end of factor H, they get a different disease entirely. So it's really important for us to be able to figure out what's going on at a very fine level of detail to be able to help clinicians and help patients and their families. This is an example of that fusion protein where instead of having a normal factor H, we now have an abnormal factor H in which the last pearl of factor H has been deleted and replaced with the last pearl of this particular protein. And this is an example of a family in which this occurred. This is the first family in the world described in which this was occurred, this occurred. And this, is now, this same rearrangement has now been discovered in a family in uh, Italy and in about 3% of families in France who have atypical HUS. And so that shows how a discovery made in this lab can have an impact throughout the world in the atypical HUS community in providing better understanding for this disease. So the composite picture with respect to complement in atypical HUS is that the C3 convertase is not controlled on the cell surface and that leads to activation of the terminal complement cascade and as a result of that activation, cell damage arises and atypical HUS is a consequence of that collective damage. Eculizumab has provided, a, is a miracle drug that has provided to all of us the ability to treat patients with atypical HUS. So then the question becomes, why do we need to do any more research. I mean, we've got eculizumab. Why don't we just throw in the towel and say we're done? We've got something great, and let's all go home, watch the football game, have a beer, we'll celebrate, and we're done. I'd like to propose that now, more than ever, it's more important to do genetic testing, to learn more about the disease, and to really sink our teeth into this and move forward rapidly. So why should we still study the genetics of atypical HUS? I think by focusing on the genetics of this disease, we will find that the genetics is disease defining. So what does that mean? That means that right now, as a clinician, when you try and diagnose atypical HUS, you kind of look at the clinical phenotype and it's kind of wishy-washy and some are straightforward, but a number of cases, a number, for a number of people, it's not straightforward. If we can define the genetics that will help us in optimizing the treatment. So clearly, we have to rise to the occasion if you're going to be able to define the genetics. And so we've partnered with Integrated DNA Technologies, which is here in, in uh, Coralville. It's the largest manufacturer in the world of strings of DNA to develop a, te a testing platform so that we can test all of the genes that are currently implicated in atypical HUS in less than a week for less than $500. So can we do that? Yes, I think we can do that. What's our time frame? Our time frame is two years. And so I think that it's very, very important to be able to have some kind of platform like that because while eculizumab is a miracle and it offers to all of you a miracle, it also brings with it a number of questions. You've started to use eculizumab in a patient with atypical HUS and they've responded. How long are you going to use it? And although there have been clinical trials, Nobody has enough longitudinal data, nobody has enough data over time to figure out who should get eculizumab for how long and how much. And I suspect that some of those answers are going to be dependent on our understanding 
of the disease in finer detail with a be better mechanistic insight as to what's going on. And then what else does the future hold? Is eculizumab going to be the only anti-complement drug available? The answer is no. Alexion has a number of drugs in their, their pipeline. There are two places in Europe that are currently right now re making recombinant factor H. Does recombinant factor H have a role in the treatment of atypical HUS? Mutations in factor H are the most commonly found mutations in patients with atypical, H factor, uh, with atypical HUS. Those mutations, as I mentioned to you earlier, are, are classified as type 1 or type 2. Type 1 mutations are inactivating mutations, mean, meaning that those patients have decreased levels of factor H, and there are at least 21 type 1 mutations in the database right now. So that means for those 21 persons and their families, maybe instead of eculizumab, they could consider factor H when that becomes available. Is that a good idea or is that a bad idea? I don't know. I would think that it could offer um, some advantages, for example, over eculizumab because then you're not stopping the remainder of the complement system. You're, in fact, replacing what's deficient and what needs to be replaced. And so my point is that when you get a sore throat and you get a strep culture and you're put on an antibiotic, you're put on an antibiotic that's specific for what's growing in your throat to which sensitivity testing has been done so that you know as the patient that the antibiotic you're receiving is going to work. And by analogy, atypical HUS is complicated. Understanding the intricacies of the disease can be unraveled by providing a genetic understanding of the disease, which can only be provided by thorough genetic studies. And that offers all of us in the future the opportunity to complement the miracle of eculizumab with other miracles that are sure to come. So thank you for your attention.